Hey folks, Quilly Team here and welcome to another Civilization 6 tutorial for complete beginners. In the last episode we got started here as America and in between episodes I've just advanced long enough. This slinger just finished, we're still one turn away from mining completing. And down here my warrior has found a tribal village. I've just ex uh, explored to the south here and found a tribal village. So let's go ahead and deal with our instructions here one at a time as before. We're just going to start responding to events. We now have to choose our production here in Washington because where our slinger has finished. So again, I'm quite inclined to build another warrior here because as every person who's played a previous version of Civilization has discovered in Civilization 6, barbarians are crazy. Barbarians are neutral units. They do not represent another civilization. They're not a true opponent, but they are still very aggressive and can swarm your cities and cause a lot of problems. Having more military units can help you defend against that. And again, if you're playing on higher difficulties, it's very important. If you're only playing on Settler or Warlord, you probably don't have to be this paranoid, but I think it's gonna be a good idea. It's worth noting that the Settler is now available to build, which was not before. A Settler is what you use to build a new city, as I've said, but when you build a Settler, when you complete a Settler, it actually drops your current city's population by one because that population is basically packing up and migrating away. So let's take a moment, since we're talking about settlers and population, to talk about what that means. Here in Washington, we now have a population of two. Uh, this bar on the left side of the city panel shows you how long it's gonna take to grow the city again, which is now going to be in 10 turns. How does a city grow? Well, over here on your little city panel, you've got a variety of numbers. This tells you how much of various resources the city is producing every turn. Note that, for example, this is your empire. Our empire as a whole is producing 3.6 science per turn. Now, of course, since I only have one city, all that science is clearly coming from Washington over here, and you can see the 3.6 science. That's cool. Note that we have food over here. Food, in Washington, we are producing an excess of six food every turn. There is no food reference over here. That's because food is always something that is only local to a city. It is not a global resource. But the way it works is this bar at the bottom here, this is turns until growth, or the one on the side here, this fills up a little bit every turn based on your excess food over here. And so as you pile in more and more and more food, when this bar fills up, your city will have an extra person. What are these people and what do they do? Well, probably the best way to demonstrate that is to hit this button over here, manage citizens. Now, managing citizens is not something that you're probably going to do as a newer player um, because it, you know, it's a little bit micromanagement and maybe it's not the sort of thing that you, you understand or maybe it is. But more importantly, even if you don't care to actually do the management, this shows you the people in your city and where they work. So you see how they've got these lit up little tiles over here, these icons? This shows you which tiles your city is working and getting benefits from. You always get the city, the tile that your city is founded on, you always get the resources for that automatically. It doesn't take a population to do it. So you can see here that Washington, because of where it is, it's producing every turn two food and one production. The gear is the production icon. Production is how you build things. Everything has a production cost, and so the amount of time it's gonna take you to build something depends on how much production per turn you are making. So the central tile here is giving us two food and one production. Over here, you can see that our citizens, your, your, your city's governor automatically tries to pick what it thinks are the best tiles for your citizens to work. And when you're a new player, it's perfectly fine to just use that. You can see that uh, we have one of our citizens. So the, the central tile gets worked automatically. And then with our population of two, two more tiles will get worked. So it's working the stone over here, which is producing two food and two production. And it's also producing this, uh, working this rainforest diamond tile, which is producing two food, one production, and three gold per turn. It's a very rich tile in terms of money. The more food that gets worked, the faster your city will grow. Now, it's worth noting that your, um... oh yeah, I was gonna say, this is how much food we're producing every single turn. This is not in excess, which is a little bit deceptive um, because each one of your people in your city 
eat two food every single turn. So with a city of size two, that means we need four food every turn just to break even. We're currently producing six, so your people are eating four of that, which means we have an excess food of two. And that two food every turn is gonna get added to the stockpile, and when it maxes out, it's gonna grow. What you can do on this screen is you can click these little icons to lock a citizen to work a tile. For example, if you really wanted your city to grow a little faster, you could click right over here. You could see it locks a citizen onto this tile. Now we're working this tile, which is three food, one production. So it's one less production than the stone, but one more food. So what you should think, if this happens, clearly we'll build things more slowly, but we should grow faster. And we can actually see that happen. We are now producing seven food per turn, and we are going to grow in seven turns. So instead of growing in 10 turns, it'll grow in seven. Note that this panel here didn't update in real time. Hopefully that'll get fixed in a, in a patch. But um, this number down here updated successfully. So we're going to grow Washington a lot faster. The bigger your city, the more tiles get worked. So the more production you produce. And also a lot of other things happen. Bigger cities are a lot better. But depending on where you are, you might have a hard time feeding all your people. Keep in mind, if every person eats two food, so if we assign a person to work this tile, all they're doing is feeding themselves and literally doing nothing else. Of course, we can improve these tiles later on. That's what builders are going to be for. So, um, and you can see I can click again to unlock this tile and the city governor is like, I'm gonna put this back over here. Instead of locking tiles, the other thing you can do is you can click on these little buttons here to tell your city's governor to focus on a particular resource. For example, if you wanted the city to grow as fast as possible but didn't want to micromanage these tiles, you could just click on this little button here next to the food and say, I really want you to focus on food. And if we do that, you can see the governor automatically changed the production to work the higher food tile over here. If I click again, it'll actually cross that out and say, I don't want you to prioritize on food. So in this case, it just puts us back to before because there's no, nothing else really makes any sense. But basically, with the red cross out, it will tell your governor that like, I don't care anything about food, just try to maximize the tile otherwise. If you click again, it clears it and goes back to its default behavior. We can also do something like focus on production, which in this case doesn't change anything because of our setup, that's okay, um, and so on and so forth. So you can tune your, your production by doing that or by manually moving things around. But it's very nice, at least the first time, to click on this button to understand what your city population means and what the different resources mean. So, but we're not gonna go and mess with it as is. So I've talked about a few times that we can improve the terrain with builders. So, if I was on a higher difficulty, I would be very tempted to build another warrior. But for tutorial purposes and because we're on a lower difficulty, I will just go ahead and build a builder here. So we can talk about how builders work to improve these tiles, which I'm very excited about. Especially since we're working on mining here and we'll be able to mine the stone and potentially mine the diamond as well. That sounds great. So we got a unit that needs orders. This slinger has been built. So this slinger also has a movement of two, very similar to the warrior, um, but it has a melee strength of five. Let's compare. The warrior has a melee strength of 20. Warriors are very good at beating on people's heads with their clubs. In fact, if a warrior were to attack a slinger, it would potentially kill it in a single round of attack because it's four times more powerful than melee. It's a big difference. Why then would we build a slinger? Well, a slinger, is a ranged unit. It only has a range of one, so it, rain, it can only hit something that is adjacent to it, but it hits with the ranged strength, and whereas in melee combat, both units hit each other, a, a, a ranged unit just does a ranged attack and doesn't get hit back. So even though a slinger is overall quite a bit weaker than a warrior, it makes up for that for the fact that it can attack with impunity. For now, we're mostly gonna use it for some scouting. Um, I'm tempted to go east, but I'm also tempted to see what's on the other side of these hills over here. I think I will go east for now. So I'm gonna go over there and we'll see. We can't see through the woods, but that's okay. Um, and this warrior, even though it's saying next turn over here, because of the way I, oh! Right, because of the way I had some commands queued up. It wasn't prompting me to do anything. That's actually worth talking about. This warrior, I gave it instructions. I think it was standing over here, or, or I think over here when I saw the goodie hut, and I told it to move to this tile over here. If I hit next turn, it's not actually gonna end my turn. This warrior is gonna execute that queued up command. You can see from this cancel over here that it's got something in the queue. It's a little bit confusing, but I'm gonna show you here. I'm gonna hit next turn and all that's gonna happen, the warrior's gonna move to here. We won't actually progress the next turn. You can see it's turn nine. I'm gonna hit next turn. 
Warrior is going to move here, finish its Q, but it, the game recognizes that, okay, you finished all your queued up movement, but you actually have some movement left over, so maybe you want to actually give this guy an order before you, we really end our turn. Very convenient. So this is a tribal village, or as many of us like to call them, goody huts. These things are completely passive, friendly things that the, um, the first person to enter them gets a bonus. So we want to go and absolutely explore every single tribal village we find, and we'll get a reward. Here, we got a Eureka. This is, we got a boost towards the wheel, and then the tribal village goes away. All right, so no one else gets that bonus. They're just, they're basically little treasures that you can find. So we talked, I think, in the last episode about the boost. And if we look at the wheel over here, you can see the wheel has been boosted. Half of the research towards the wheel has been completed for us. Normally, the way to get a boost for the wheel is to mine a resource. Well, we are about to get that anyway. So this is a little disappointing, if I'm honest, uh, because we were going to mine a, wheel, a resource for sure. But you can see the little arrow for the boost has been filled in, right? These are clear arrows. This has been filled in. This boost has been completed. You can't double boost a technology or anything like that. It just happens one time. But now if we do decide to research the wheel, it'll be faster, which I guess is pretty nice. So that's one of the many rewards that you can get from these goody huts, from these tribal villages. All right, now we're going to hit next turn, and it's going to next turn for real. We're going to do that. And mining is about to finish. We were one turn away from mining. More there it is. The wife of a coal miner. So this unlocks the ability for us to build mines as well as the ability for us to build quarries. These are both done with builders and we are currently working on a builder. We have to choose another technology. You can see there's actually slightly more in the list now than before. And the reason for that is mining was the prerequisite for three different technologies. So they all get added in there. What are we gonna research next? So again, you know, you can pick a few different things. A lot of times um, I, I do look to see if the boost, if there's a boost, if a technology has a boost that I haven't done, but it's not too hard to do, then often I won't research it because I really want to wait until the boost has come in. Uh, again, the baseline pot or the baseline technologies like mining or animal husbandry and pottery can never get a boost. So a lot of times I grab them or I look into things I really, really want to have happen quite soon. For example, I might really want to get a, um, a religion, in which case I need astrology in place here. Astrology unlocks the ability to build a holy site district, and I really want to showcase districts, so I think I'm going to go and grab that. Not only that, but actually unlocks the ability for us to build a Stonehenge wonder. Stonehenge is a world wonder. Only one can be built in the entire world. They tend to be very powerful, but often uh, take a lot of time to build. It's a big investment, and if someone else starts building it before you and beats you to it, ooh, that hurts a lot. But a lot of the, the wonders have specific requirements as to where they can be placed. Stonehenge has to be built A, on flat land, and B, next to stone. That's kind of annoying for us because we have stone. That's good. A lot of times you don't have stone. But it also has to be built on flat land next to stone. Well, this is a hill. This is a hill. Yes, it's outside of our borders, but as you can tell from the weed over here, your borders clearly grow. We haven't talked about that yet, but we will soon. Um, so I can't build Stonehenge on these hills. I can't build it where the city is. So I could build it here. This is flat land, but... If I build Stonehenge on here, it's going to replace everything in the tile, including lose the diamonds. We're going to build Stonehenge, I guess, on top of the diamonds, so we won't get to mine the diamonds. Or I could build them here, so I would lose the horses. I don't think building Stonehenge is in our cards, which is unfortunate. But I think I'm still going to start researching astrology here because I'd like the holy site. Maybe we'll get lucky with our exploration and find a natural wonder. Um, and get a boost. Maybe we won't. Who knows? I mean, eventually you'll get one, but you don't necessarily want to hold off on astrology that long. So I'm picking that mostly because I want to showcase the districts. Plus, religion is very cool. Now, this to me really looks like a like a peninsula that's a dead end. But for you know, just checking, I want to go. To, oh, there is more stone over here. And really, this becomes a place we could build Stonehenge. This tile over here. That's very interesting. Because we could build a settler, settle down here, and build Stonehenge over there. The problem with that is by the time we do all that, someone may have built it already and beaten, beaten us to it, which would be very disappointing. That being said, this remains a really good city location. How can you tell if it's a good city location? Well, generally, you want to settle near places that have a lot of resources. So if I built a city here, keeping in mind that your city has a full range of three eventually. You can't work the tiles outside of your borders, right? I can't work these tiles over here, but eventually our borders will grow and eventually our city will be able to work all the tiles within three. 
assuming you've got enough people to do that. Um, so, you know, you sort of look around and you say, all right, so let's say I built a city here. Um, I'd clearly be able to reach the fish, the crabs, the stone, this crab, and actually, one, two, three, I'd actually be able to work both diamonds. Ooh. On the other hand, maybe I'd like to settle a little closer to Washington. Maybe I want to build a city here. So a city here would get this crab, these two diamonds, that crab. Well, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's a little tight and overlap. If I build the city here, they, I mean, they don't fight over the resource, but only, only one city can work each tile. So if I build a city in the north here that works these crabs, then my southern city won't get to also work the crabs. You have to pick, you'll have to choose which one works each tile. It's not bad to have some overlap. You want to avoid too much because it's not really efficient, but it's not too terrible. So all of a sudden, we've got some inter really interesting decisions to make. Who knows where we'll settle first? All right, I'm gonna move my slinger maybe this way into the rainforest. It's gonna cost two movement, so it will end my turn. But oh, we got cattle on the other side. One, two, three. In fact, this cattle tile here could eventually be worked by Washington. I don't usually stress too much about things that are three tiles away because it will take a long time for your borders to expand that far. And you may you may end up just building, like if I built a city here, this city will probably be the one that works these cattle. So Washington may or may not be the one who works that tile in the end. All right, let's go ahead and move there. So I guess this is a good time for us to talk about border growth. When you settle a city, you get within your borders, obviously the city itself, and every tile adjacent to that city falls within your borders automatically. Then, over time, you accumulate culture in your cities. Uh, your capital automatically creates some, and then there's other buildings that will produce culture. For example, the monument. The culture you produce per turn eventually fills up and, cr and pops out a new tile. Now, as far as I can tell, it's not actually visible here. If I click the city details, is it visible there? Surprisingly not. I feel like I must be missing it. It's got to be somewhere. It used to be very visible in Civ 5. But at a glance, I'm not seeing a meter that fills up. But culture is what causes your, your city's borders to expand out automatically. So that's what happened with the wheat over here. And your city will automatically try to expand towards resources. So it prioritized the wheat tile as opposed to, say, the flat land over here. But what it might do next is grab this flat land tile so that it can then afterwards grab the fur. Your city will naturally grab flat tiles first and try to work towards resources. So it might even go into the sea over here to work its way towards the fish. In addition to that, you've got this button here to purchase a tile. You can spend gold. This is our gold reserve. We currently have 93 and we're making 8.4 per turn. You can spend gold to buy tiles. They start off relatively cheap and the cost goes up over over time and I think with every purchase. So if you really, really want to get to the fur quite quickly, we could go and buy this tile and then we'll probably need to save up a little bit more, but then buy the fur at some point. Or maybe if we buy this tile, maybe the next time the city expands its borders, it might grab the fur for us, cross our fingers. So there are ways that you can accelerate that. It's also worth noting, you can also hit this button here to purchase units with gold or anything with gold, really. You can't buy a district with gold because the district always has to get built because it has to be built in a tile and I don't know. But buildings, including buildings that go in districts can be purchased with gold as well as units over here, although clearly we don't have the money for that right now. All right, so my slinger, I'm gonna just keep moving around and maybe I'll get lucky and find a natural resource and we'll uh, boost astrology, or maybe we won't. We're just gonna keep skipping ahead for now. Do, 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 do. And we'll keep this going at least until we've got the builder so we can show how that works. Hey, another goody hut! Ooh, and another nice city spot over here. In fact, if we do settle here, maybe the next city will in fact be down here. I realize it doesn't get the stone and whatnot. Why am I so excited? Well, over on your mini-map here, which I haven't really talked about, but this is the map of your known world at this time. Above the mini-map, there's a button here that says Lenses. If you click on that, you get a variety of these lenses, and you can poke around with them. But one of the most interesting ones is the Settler Lens over here. If we do this, it colorifies the world map. What is this showing? This shows you where you can settle. Once you have a settler, where can you build a city? Red tiles, you are not allowed to build a city in. And the reason for that is all cities must be... Uh, four tiles away from each other. So this is three tiles. I can't build a city here, but I could build one here. Note that then my city could then, like this second city, whatever it ends up being called, Boston or something, I don't know. So let's say this becomes Boston here. Boston could work these tiles. In fact, it could work all the way up to the diamonds because it's within three tiles. But I can't actually settle this tile 
over here. I'd have to settle at least this far away. And this includes for your opponents. Your opponents can't settle too close to you. What's the other color? So red, you can't settle. The other colors show you how uh, the accessibility of water. These sort of bluish gray tiles, this city here would have no access to water whatsoever. And that affects something called housing. Over here, and you can actually see there's a key over here, right? Over here, we're on the coast, these light green tiles. Light green tiles are coastal waters. They get plus one housing. Bright green tiles over here have access to fresh water, like a river or an inland lake, and they get plus three housing. Ideally, you want to settle your cities in the bright green spots so you have fresh water access with maximum housing. But it's not the end of the world if you don't, and there's other ways to effectively get fresh water, especially with something called an aqueduct. By the way, there's a question mark over here in the top right corner. This opens the Civilopedia and allows you to search most concepts as well as buildings and units and things like that in the game. So if I say something like aqueduct, and you're like, oh, what does that do? You can search for aqueduct and try to read up on it and get a lot of good information that way. All right, so... Um, yeah, so that's why I'm like, oh, maybe settling near the river would be quite nice. Yes, we found a tribal village. Thank you very much. Unit needs orders. I'm going to move to here. So I see what's on the other side of the forest. Of course, that eats my movement. The marsh also would eat my movement. But even if there wasn't a marsh here, I wouldn't be able to move here and cross the river. I need all my movement available to be able to cross the river. <gasps> and I just met my first neighbor. It's Cleopatra of Egypt. Hello, you have a very shiny hat and a lovely eyeshadow. Thank you very much. Um, what do you got to say? So you are the living Nile. Excellent. I'm Cleopatra and an ally if you are worthy. So I'm going to be nice and say it's an honor to meet you. I mean, how we, um, how we respond here will affect our early diplomatic relations. We could be rude and she would not like us as much. Now, sometimes that might be something you want to do because maybe you're itching for war and you'd be quite happy to lure them to attack you, right? Get them to declare war while you've secretly been masking an army. But we're going to be nice. It's an honor to meet you. She wants to exchange information on our capitals. Of course, that does give them a little bit more information um, about where you are. But generally speaking, it's not that bad. The, they will find you at some point by exploring. And if you do this, you'll find out where their capital is. So that can give us a lot more information. And because we met a civilization, we got a boost towards writing. Isn't that lovely? So how did we meet? Well, we met because we ran into a unit. So this is our slinger. This is an Egyptian scout. We met each other, so we were able to say hi. But if we zoom out, we can also see where her capital is, right over here, Ra Cadet. Quite far to the north, actually. We're, I don't feel like this is very close. If she drops another city sort of here, then all of a sudden, ooh, all right, then we're getting a little bit close to each other. Or if I decide to settle up here, I mean, God, all the cattle, the rice, the stone. There's Actually, there's another stone next to flat land if we do want to build that stone hedge. But again, someone could already be building it now. Someone could be building it in their capital if they happen to be next to stone, in which case, by the time we settle over here and start stone hedge, we won't actually be able to get it. But, you know, it's something to keep in mind. If nothing else, stone's always good because it's more production. So, all right, that's fine. Um, I want to go and get to this goody hut here. But, of course, you can tell by the blue outline, I can't reach it this turn. Partially because I need all my movement to be able to cross the river. But even if it wasn't the river, this is in a forest and we need two movement to be able to enter the forest. So I'm just going to go, say, down here, reveal a bit more of the coast. Ooh, man, more wheat, crabs. Wow, what a nice little spot. And so that's the end of my, I can't cross the river. I could decide to go over here or I could just say, listen, skip the rest of your turn. We're done. You're, you're good where you are there. Uh, and as far as my slinger goes... I think I'm just going to cross the river and then maybe move up a little bit here. I'm just trying to explore. What Early on, what you tend to want to avoid to do is just necessarily going in a straight line. Like, my warriors, well, ended up mostly going in a straight line because I got to here and then saw the goody hut. And then I was like, oh, I'll check out the rest of the coast. Um, going sort of in a circle around your capital is good because you don't really necessarily care what's super far away from your homeland. Early on, you're trying to scout up places for potential settlements. And actually, once you've found a few good places, I love this little map pins feature. I can be like, all right, hmm, yes, uh, so we found some stuff. What if, hypothetically, I said, uh, let's build a city here. You can name it, you can do different things, put little symbols, but I'll just, I'll just leave it with a little arrow. That's going to be fine. So that would be good on, oh, oh, yeah, maybe I'll have to remember that I, I may want to settle over here. That looks pretty good to me. Um, and... Uh, I, I don't know, maybe maybe here or perhaps here. You know, you can do that. And you can name them. I can say, um, 
city. You know, you can do that. Or uh, if you've actually watched any of my other videos, I like to like num like number these. Like I'll call this like maybe this is A1 and A2. I call obviously can't settle both these places, but I'm going to consider both of these as potential city locations. And maybe we'll add another one there. And there's a bit of a bug if you just rename it now. Sometimes it renames some completely random pin. So just hit OK, then click on the pin again, and then rename it. So we'll say that maybe this is an A3. Like, any of these would probably be pretty good locations. Next to the river for the fresh water bonus. Close to a lot of resources. Uh-huh. So we'll snoop around a little bit more and then decide exactly where we may go. Really nice little way to keep track of things. You can go and hide that. You can always click on a pin and then delete it afterwards. Doesn't do anything, but it's awesome, and I love it. Okay, let's keep going because I really want to show this builder in this video here. So I'm going to try to burn through a few of these turns a little bit faster. Uh, you are going to get this goodie hut. Oh, we got a boost towards crafting shit. That's two boosts now. I'm not going to complain about that at all. Boosts are very good. I'm going to move north here. Oh, and we're going to meet the Congo. Excellent. Pleasure to meet you. I'm just going to skip through you a little faster by hitting escape. And I'm going to say, nice to see you. Excellent. Ah, and we found our first barbarian encampment over here. Very exciting. So the Congo warriors find that. So these red units here, these are barbarians. Again, they're not controlled by any civilization. They have an encampment. That's what is happening over here with the wooden palisade. With the camp, the encampment, at least early in the game, is always defended by spearmen. And they will create barbarian scouts. The scouts will roam around. If the barbarian scouts find a city and then return to their encampment, the encampment will then start to spawn a bunch of military units to go and invade the city. So it is very important early on to try to watch out for those scouts. That's another one of the reasons that you like to, you should scout sort of in a circle around your capital. Find the barbarian encampments and also find those scouts. So I'm gonna go ahead and move up over here because now this spearman does have a movement of two. He can technically attack my slinger, although I don't expect him to, partially because most likely he's going to be interested in defending his encampment. If he does decide to venture out and attack, probably he'll attack the warrior first because he's closer. But even more importantly than that, I'm really hoping, I've literally physically got my fingers crossed right now, I'm hoping that the warrior and the spearman fight a little bit and the spearman um, gets a little bit weaker. This is how many hit points it's got. Because next turn, I can move up with the slinger and sling it. And I'm hoping to kill the barbarian with my slinger. First of all, every time your units fight, your units get experience points. But, oh, I'm very best. surprised by that outcome. Man is the I, I realize it may have decided to attack me because my slinger is much weaker in melee combat. Justice. But I'm still surprised it did he that. Is the worst. We also completed our first civics. Civics, I'm just going to X out of this for a moment. Note, there is a change policies button. And we're going to pay attention to that in just a moment. But I'm just going to X out. Civics work the same way as technologies. You can see here, I have to pick a new civic or can open the civic tree and see this. Civics are basically more technologies, but instead of researching them with science, you research them with culture. You automatically start the game by um, working, I'm gonna call it researching, I don't know if that's the right term, but you automatically start the game by researching code of laws because it is the root, everything else uh, comes off of that. So there's no choice, you have to research code of laws. But after that, it breaks up into a few different directions. We did get that boost towards craftsmanship. You can see that it's been boosted. We're already halfway done. Hey, that sounds great. Let's go ahead and work on that over there. We'll talk about what you get out of, well, I guess now's a good time. Um, now that I think about it. Code of Laws, what did it give us? Well, it unlocked four different policies. Normally when you unlock a civic, it's got the button to change policies over there. You can also do it by clicking on the government button over here. Currently our government type is chiefdom. We'll talk about governments a little bit more later on, but what's important to note, everyone starts in a chiefdom and in a chiefdom, you've got space for two policies. You can put one military policy and one economic policy. These are slots over here that you've got to fill using the policy cards to the right. You, you start with the four from code of laws, but by the end of the game, you will have dozens in here. So we have to choose. For our military policy, we could take one that gives our recon units, like scouts, double experience points. Well, that's pretty good. But I think discipline is really relevant right now. Plus five strength when fighting barbarians. What well, we're literally fighting a barbarian right now. So let's put discipline in there. For economic policies, you can choose urban planning, plus one production in all cities. Ooh, that's quite nice. Or you can take God King, which gives you plus one faith and plus one gold in your capital. Well, right now we only have one city. So urban planning may not be quite as sexy. Also, one of the things that faith does early on is it gives you a pantheon. If you fill up enough faith, you will get a pantheon and that's quite nice to do. And let's just talk about religion. So I'm gonna pick God King. And honestly, 
I take God King as my first policy most of the time until I get a Pantheon, and especially once I start getting multiple cities, then I tend to switch over to urban planning. But for now, we're okay. And you can change this. If I confirm, we're gonna lock those in, our policy agenda. You can change your policies whenever you want uh, later on, like not on the same turn here, but you can change your policies whenever you want by spending gold. Or literally every time you finish researching another uh, civic, then you get to change your policies for free. Most of the time, you just change your policies for free when you get your civic. I have never ever spent gold, as far as I can recall, um, to change my policies because it happens pretty often. Okay, so what's the big deal? Why am I, was I hoping, oh no, we're not gonna do it. I was really, really hoping to be able to kill this barbarian with this slinger. Well, if we look at the tech tree, you can see the archery gets a boost if you kill a unit with a slinger. So if this barbarian had attacked the warrior and therefore been lower health, I would probably be able to kill it with the slinger on the follow-up. Now if I attack it, you can actually get a preview. I can't mouse over it, but if you look at the bottom right corner of the screen, you can see it predicts the outcome if I were to attack here. It does predict a major victory. It shows that the health bar of this, the Barbarian Spearman go, will go to almost nothing. There's just that tiny little sliver of the bright red left, so it'll have almost nothing left. And my slinger won't take any damage at all because this is a ranged attack. The problem is it won't kill it and the warrior will kill it and then I won't have the ability to um, finish off the spearman, which I don't like. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to do nothing this turn. I'm gonna tell the slinger to, I'm just gonna tell it to fortify. So what's the deal? First of all, if you don't, if you literally do nothing with a unit on your turn, it will heal. By default, that will be 10 hit points. So our slinger currently has, currently has 49 hit points. All units have a maximum hit points of 100. So we're currently at 49. If I do nothing, I'll have 59 hit points. Um, if I if I fortify as well, that's the same as sort of doing nothing, but I'll actually start to dig in and get a bit of a defensive bonus. So I'm gonna, there's also a fortify until healed. I'm gonna hit fortify until healed. This would automatically, you see the fortified unit gets a shield. Automatically, the unit will wake up again. Like, every turn it'll heal, and after it's fully healed, it'll automatically wake up and ask for commands. But I can also override this. Next turn, in fact, what I will be doing is I will wake up this unit manually to go and try to kill that barbarian, hopefully, if everything works out. So I'm gonna try to go sort of up in this direction here. I'll get on the hill for some vision. Wow, that is so much wheat. Next turn. <gasps> that is perfect, perfect, perfect. As long as this, bar this spearman doesn't do anything crazy. Oh, I'm so happy about that. Okay, this warrior attacked the spearman, but just barely failed to kill it. Look, it's got like no visible hit points over here. My spearman, or my slinger, again, was fortified until healing. And if I did nothing, it would just sit idle. But I'm gonna intentionally wake it up. I'm gonna go get it to kill. Ranged attack over here. I think if I just right click on the spearman, it would do a ranged attack by default. But I always hit the button with my ranged units, just to be sure. So you can see here, I'm gonna do a ranged attack. It's got that funny little graphic here a range attack there, I will not take any damage on the Spearman. I just deal damage, don't take anything back, and I'm guaranteed, it says decisive victory, I will kill this guy for sure. And by doing that, I get my Eureka for killing something with Slinger. I'm very, very happy about that. All right, you keep going. This video is going on way too long. We're getting events. Oh, we met our first city state. Okay, I will actually have to put a cut in here. Oh, there's our builder. Okay, I will put a cut in here. Next episode, we're going to start using our builder and we'll also talk about city states. Thanks for watching, folks. See you next time.